I would like to lead the stage to our moderator for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a big round of applause to welcome Mr. John Roberts, Director of Conservation Minor Hotel Group. I'm on the stage, please. Thank you very much. Okay, um, welcome to the session on elephants in tourism. Um, I think what I aim to do in this session is, is try and set out, or with, with the, the panelist here, is try and set out and give a few answers as to where we might go with elephants in tourism. Um, because I'm confused. Um, and I'd imagine most of you who are working within the travel industry are confused, and I would imagine most of your guests are confused. Um, there are officially 3,783 elephants in captivity in Thailand. The vast majority of them are earning an income from tourism. There is some small logging going on down in the south, um, mainly with rubber plantations. But the vast majority, to be fed, to have anything else, rely on the tourist dollar. Thailand has, or people in general, have had elephants in captivity um, for something like 4,500 years. And for almost all of that time, there was a reason to have elephants in captivity. They were kept for war purposes, they were kept for logging, they were kept to do things that no one else, nothing else could do. But comparatively recently, I mean anything's comparatively recent in a 4,500 year time, comparatively recently that situation changed. But, and the world changed, the world is changing, but the traditions of those who look after them they don't think it's changed. Um, and so we were left, I think, must have been before I got here, so maybe 15 years ago, uh, Richard Lair put out a book called Giants on Our Hands. And that probably describes the situation even more now than it did then. We are left with 3,783 elephants in Thailand that exist. They are here. They need to eat. They can't all go back into the forest. Some have... Well, there are some nice experiments to try and put them back into the forest, some of them, but they can't all go back. The question is, what do we do with them? Tourism has cropped up to provide an answer, but is that a longer term answer? What can we do? And is tourism good for elephants? I did my homework yesterday for once in my life. Usually I don't. Um, but yesterday I went up to Mer Wang. I thought, since I was going to head this panel, I'd have a look at some elephants in tourism because I used to manage an elephant camp. Um, I do still have an oversight of an elephant foundation. I do look at an elephant camp, but it's, it's my camp. It does things my way. Um, I have some projects in Bantaklang, in Surin, where there are a lot of unemployed elephants, but there's very, very little inbound tourism there. There's a, quite a bit of domestic tourism, but very little inbound tourism. And a lot of the tourism is not the sort of tourism we would be recommending. So I went up to Merwang to have a look at lots of elephant camps. Um, and I got confused further still. I saw skinny girls in bikinis washing fat elephants. I saw fat men, not, on, not in bikinis, thank goodness, riding skinny elephants. Um, I don't know, one of the questions I always get asked because I've been in the elephant business for such a long time is, can you recommend a camp? Or I've heard of this camp, what do you think of it? Well, it seems they're all called the same thing, or close to the same thing. We were just discussing this with the vets yesterday. I think um, everybody, pe people see a lot of positive attention for Elephant Nature Park, and they all want to be Elephant Nature Park, but that's taken. So they, they have a look, and they look at synonyms for elephant. Well, elephant's always in there, but what's nature and park? There's elephant, happy, home, chang, chang, something. They're all called roughly the same thing. And yet, they all have different methods of looking after elephants. They all offer different activities. Um, of course, 
I'd like to hope the majority of the people in that valley who managed elephants thought they were doing the best by elephants, but with so many different opinions for themselves and they're all doing different things, who knows? What is good for elephants? Um, as we all know, I mean, people for, what, 4,500 years, people have sat on top of elephants. A couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, people started calling up and saying, riding elephants is bad, which, when you apply logic to it, sounds preposterous. An elephant's a very, very large thing, and a person's a very small thing. But we all know, those of us who've been in and out of the business, that people can, there are, bad elephant managers, there are bad mahouts. It's not necessarily the sitting on the elephant that people are upset about, it's what happens before then. It's how they are trained, it's how they are looked after, it's how they're put in the forest. But when you ask the question, what is good for elephants? Because they can't talk, they don't, people don't really know, no one can give you, well everybody can give you a straight answer, lots of people will give you a straight answer, but really there's very little evidence out there. Um, we all have an idea. Um, you would have thought, as I say, for 4,500 years ago, if sitting on an elephant was bad for the elephant, then somebody would have noticed. But in those days, people were catching elephants out of the forest to go and take over entire new countries and enslave people. So they won't have been thinking, I don't think, about elephants' mental needs because they're not even thinking really about their conquered people's mental needs. Times have changed. Our attitudes have changed. Is it viable to keep elephants in captivity anymore? Yes, there's a long tradition. Yes, they've been doing it for a long time, but should we actually be having our own control over these sentient animals? Again, a lot of people will give you an opinion. There is a lot, a very, very deep cultural need within Thailand to have elephants in captivity, but should we be creating more? Should we be breeding? Again, nobody knows. Luckily, because I'm confused, I'm sort of, probably I've been managing elephants, as I've said, in one form or another since 1999. Um, I'm probably as immersed in elephant law as it's possible to be for someone who's under the age of 50 and was born in Forangland, spent the first 21 of years of his life messing around in Forangland. Um, but I don't know. But luckily, um, people are beginning to find out. People are beginning to look. And not luckily, very skillfully, uh, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council have got some really great minds together to try and tell you what they've been doing to try and answer these questions. Um, again, I think we've got a long way to go before we have a one-size-fits-all answer, but we will try and give you, in the travel business, some answers, some idea as to where we're going. Um, we have three PhDs. Do, do you have a PhD? You do, yeah, sorry, Daniel and Mia, PhDs. So we've got three PhDs. We're lucky to have the two people, two of the people who've undertaken the four most in-depth studies of elephants that have been done recently, but probably at all. Um, Dr. Yan has actually done it twice, um, and he's going to be our first speaker. So Yan has spent, would you, when did you do your first one? Oh, he'll tell you this, sorry, he'll tell you this. But basically, Jan, Jan's been to just about every tourist elephant camp in Thailand. Uh, he's probably seen more elephants than you have. Um, he went through and systematically looked at every camp, listed what was going on, wrote a very, very good report, which you should read, I've, I've linked to it later on, um, about the conditions that he found. I'm not going to steal his thunder because he's going to tell you all about it. Um, but he will form the baseline for what we're talking about. Then we have Dr. Im from Chiang Mai University. She went to fewer camps, but looked really in depth, talked to Mahouts, worked out how far elephants walked on, each elephant walked on average per day, um, looked at what conditions they were in. Did the Mahouts carry a hook? Did the Mahouts overuse the hook? And then compared that to the stress hormones of the elephants to see was the elephant, because that's the closest thing that we can do to know if an elephant is happy or not, is, is it stressed? Um, so she's done that, and she's in the process of publishing this and getting it peer-reviewed. Um, two papers already, and then a few more which she'll quote, and I won't steal her thunder. Next, we have Dr. Chachot, Dr. Bick, who heads up the Elephant Research and Excellence Center in Chiang Mai University. Another PhD, did a PhD in must bulls, I think. 
Um, no, he didn't. Okay, I'll let him tell you that as well. I don't know him very well. Um, he runs a mobile clinic, uh, several mobile clinics. And so while Dr. Yan and Dr. Im's session or, or uh, surveys are necessarily, in one way or another, a snapshot of what's going on, Dr. Bick has vets in the camps moving around every day, monitoring what's going on, monitoring the habits of mahouts, monitoring the health of elephants, of course, being vets. That's, that's their job. So he's going to tell us a little bit about what he's found out and how, how that affects and how the different tourism things affect the health of the elephant as he sees it moving forward. Then we have Daniel Turner, um, who, whose job is, I think, he's a professional at taking all of this information that these brilliant scientists, the PhDs, gather for us, and turning it into a set of standards, something measurable. I mean, you heard Randy talk about standards this morning, and so I'm not going to go into that, because, of course, Randy is the expert. Um, and he's going to explain what he's done in the past. He's helped write what is currently the European, if not industry standard, set of standards uh, that everybody uses. And he's going to tell us how he did that and how he might use any bits of new information, such as the ones our PhDs are coming up with, to, uh, to change the standards, to, to make sure our, all of our knowledge is best updated. And last, but certainly not least, um, we have Nia Klatter, who is from Exo Travel. And she's got the most difficult job of all because she's got to go and take all of this, all of this information, and make sure, first of all, because she's the sustainability director, that she's going to a place that's looking after elephants well, first and foremost, but also has to be able to explain that to her guests, to her travelers, to people who are coming in, and make sure that what she's doing is doing good for elephants and people know what's happening, um, which, as I say, I've managed an elephant camp, so I know how difficult that is. So. Without further ado, I'd like to, uh, like to invite everybody up onto the stage and uh, let's, let's have some presentations. So, could you please come up? Dr. Yan, Dr. Im, Dr. Bick, Daniel, and Nia. And this being the first panel, we don't know what we're supposed to be doing, so we're just going to play it by ear. And some of them are going to sit down and some of them are going to walk around. Some might dance if you're lucky. It's free and easy. Can you all see the screen? Because he's got some good slides. Great. Um, is this on? Yeah, I think so. Thanks a lot, John, for the introduction. Um, it's a bit funny that we are supposed to have answers now, but I think we, I think we do, but it does sound a bit uh, intimidating. But um, I think all of us did quite a lot of work on elephants in Thailand, so we try our best to share uh, what we found in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, is, is this really on? It seems like not really loud enough, but I hope you can hear me. Um, Down. Down? Right. All right. So, um, my name is uh, Jan Schmidt Bobrach. I work as global wildlife and veterinary advisor for um, an NGO called World End Protection. It's an animal welfare NGO. And I'm a veterinarian with a PhD in elephant health and welfare. And, no, okay. Um, and have about 14 years experience working globally on um, animal welfare and illegal wildlife trade and, and various issues. 12 years of that have been based in Thailand and Asia um, and have been leading, as John was saying, two of um, larger scale research studies on elephants used in tourism. The first one was in 2010, which pretty much was, to my knowledge, the first of its kind to try to look at how many elephant camps there really are and what conditions the elephants face. And the second one was in 2015, where we revisited all the camps in Thailand, tried to find out how many more there are but also included um, other Asian countries. So in 2015, we found uh, 150 venues across Thailand. We visited them multiple times, partially, and um, we collected data on the mobility of the elephants, the restraints, hygiene, diet, all sorts of things, um, the visitor interaction, the social interaction between the elephants, 
And we distilled that down into a score between 1 and 10. That's supposed to give you a rough indicator on the conditions the elephants, elephants would face um, in those camps. Um, I emphasize it's a rough indicator because we don't have the depth of um, animal welfare assessment that, for example, um, my next speaker will probably have. But it does go a long way to give a good understanding where the elephant tourism situation is at. The results weren't really surprising, but they were still sobering. Um, we found that on that scale, about 80% of elephants were kept in severely inadequate conditions with scores five or lower. And only 7% were kept in um, what we would call good conditions um, as far as captive situations go. These are biologically wild animals, so meeting their needs in captivity is difficult. Ideally, what we would like to see, and I think we would all agree on this, we would like to see a shift of these numbers towards the right um, of the scale so that the elephants would be kept in better conditions. But there are a few challenges to do that. Um, two of them probably the most dominant ones. One is the sheer number of elephants. It's difficult to provide great environments for 2,000 something elephants. Um, and um, for example, land, resources, skilled labor, all that needs to be available. It's possible for a number of elephants, but is it possible for all is a question mark. The other challenge is that there is little incentive for many of the camps to actually change their practices because tourism still pays for the conditions that they are standing in right now. So why should they move ahead, which costs more money? Why should they change their practices? Um, we also looked at the situation for mahouts. Uh, mahouts are quite intrinsic to the welfare of elephants because they take care of the elephants 24 hours a day. Um, we did a study last year interviewing 200 mahouts from 80 camps together with the university in Thailand. And we found throughout that mahouts would face low salaries, poor working conditions, and a really high risk of injuries working with those elephants. Um, three out of four mahouts have worked in other fields um, before becoming a mahout, so for example in agriculture, and more than 50% come from families that have never owned an elephant. I'm saying this because there's often this misconception that all mahouts come from this long line of traditional um, mahouts. They do exist, but it's becoming less and less, and that's mainly due to the um, influence tourism has um, that we see an increasing number of unskilled labor becoming mahout. In fact, more than 50% of the mahouts we interviewed received only one month training before being let loose in tourism camps with the elephants, which is um, worrying, I would say. Um, a lot of them have no financial savings. Um, one third have been injured during the work. 50% of them are still in pain when we talk to them. And taking all this in summary, it's not surprising that when being asked what they want their child to be, they said only 12% said they want their child to be a mahout, because clearly this is not a very attractive line of work. Now let's look at the bigger picture here, um, because again, there's sometimes a bit of misconception here. It's quite important though to, um, to understand this for our discussion. Um, the captive elephant population has increased by over 30% since 1992, which is shortly after the logging ban. Um, that means we have 30% more elephants in captivity now than um, about 27 years ago. That means that less than half of the elephants today are former logging elephants. And this is important to understand because again, there's a misconception that we definitely need tourism to take care of all these old logging elephants, which was really important 20 years ago, but it's becoming less and less important as those logging elephants die. In fact, through the studies that we've done, uh, we've seen a 30% increase in the tourism elephants in 2010 to 2015. So tourism is nowadays the primary driver for increasing the captive elephant population. And that has effects to the welfare. As I said before, one of the biggest challenges in providing better for elephants is lack of resources, lack of land, lack of skilled labor. The more captive elephants there are, the less we can take care of them well and the more risks we will face for mahouts and visitors as well. So one important thing is really to look at what can be done to incentivize change in the tourism industry. And for us, the key lies here in shifting demand away from low welfare activities um, to support 
better practices that take care better of the elephant, but also provide a better environment for mahouts and still interesting for visitors. Um, we have a concept that we call it elephant friendly. It's not really rocket science. Um, there's documents out there you can find. Um, they're based on an observation only model where the visitor would only be able to observe the elephants. There's no direct interaction, um, including high welfare elephant management and focusing really on enabling natural behavior that the elephants would biologically want to express. So for example, socializing with other elephants if they like to forage, um, give access, free access to water and dust and mud baths and so on. This will lead to also better work conditions for the mahouts um, and lower safety risks because as soon as you remove the visitor from the direct vicinity of an elephant, the mahout can relax because he doesn't need to be worried again that, that his elephant might hurt a tourist and he is responsible for that. And the elephant relaxes because he realizes that the mahout is relaxed and actually lets me do some things that I would really like to do. Um, and for the visitor, it opens up a completely different perspective on, on seeing elephants because they actually start seeing them behaving as elephants should be and they also see that sort of interaction with the mahout who is gently supervising them from the side. 12% of tourists in Thailand are willing to spend 100 US dollars and more for such an experience, so there is definitely the economic will here. And um, I think also with the travel companies that we work with, and a lot of them were involved in creating tools that we um, make available to elephant camps to help them change their practices, so like this business model that you see on the side. Um, with all of them, I think it's quite clear there is a will to support such, such um, elephant-friendly facilities, yet there are very few out there. And I think this is something really interesting to mark and something to discuss why there are so few out there and how can we advance that forward. Um, I think it's a really great opportunity for Thailand to use the elephants in this sort of concept and step away from practices that have been practiced so far and um, have led to a lot of criticism. So hopefully we can see a more positive and bright future by um, embracing such a concept. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jan. Now, Dr. Im. We're just going to move out of your way. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Pakanut Bansit. You can call me Im. I am a PhD student at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Chiang Mai University. I used to work at an elephant camp in Metang district in Chiang Mai for about four years. After that, I moved to work at the Center of Elephant and Wildlife Research, Chiang Mai University for about four years to expand my knowledge and gain more experiences. Then I decided to study a PhD at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Chiang Mai University, about health and welfare of captive elephants used in tourism in Northern Thailand. And to gain more understanding about the welfare status of captive elephants used in tourism, we have done several projects uh, at the faculty by the support from Chiang Mai University uh, Thai Research Fund, as well as Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And uh, we started with a survey in 33 camps in Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, and Mehong Son province by using a questionnaire interviews. Uh, after that, 122 elephants in the subset of 15 camps were assessed body condition, foot health, and skin wounds as uh, physical parameters. We also assessed glucocorticoid metabolite concentrations, or we can call a stress hormone as a physiological parameter. And the last one we assessed 
stereotypic or abnormal repetitive behaviors as a behavioral parameter. So we assess all of these for about one year. And another big study, uh, we monitored uh, 46 elephants in the subset of five camps to monitor their lipid profiles and metabi metabolic parameters. And here are the findings that we found from our studies from the assessment of physical and physiological outcomes, welfare outcomes. So we need more study on the behavioral outcomes. Next study. Uh, briefly, we found that high body condition score or being overweight was associated with high amount of supplement, such as banana and sugar cane that tourists give to elephants during the program. We also found that uh, skin wounds, uh, especially on the head of elephant, was associated with using hooks. If you know the hook or end gas that, that, that the mahouts carry to control elephants during working. And we also found that uh, foot problems was associated with concrete floor uh, during, during working or the walking routes and also associated with the uh, long walking distance and long walking time, for example. And the most interesting one is about the uh, stress hormone level, glucocorticoid metabolite. Uh, we found that it is different between the type of work. We found that elephants that work in the observation only program just feed just observe, no riding, no walking, had higher stress hormone level. And elephants in the, um, in the riding program or riding elephants had lower, has lesser hormone level compared to elephants that work in the observation only program. So that means elephants need exercise. They need to walk, they need to socialize, and they need um, we can call mahout elephant relationship with um, which uh, riding program can provide this kind of things. We also found that high body condition score or being overweight was associated with high stress hormone, high metabolic parameters such as glucose, fructosamine, and insulin levels, and high lipid profile, such as total cholesterol and LDL. That means fat elephants are not good and, can, and may cause um, metabolic diseases like human. And furthermore, we found that in the high tourist season, especially in the winter season, in Thailand, uh, elephants had higher stress hormone level. So maybe it uh, may cause by the high workload or the high numbers of tourists interacting with individual elephants. So we need to fix that problem. Um, in addition, we also found that elephants were given a uh, higher amount of supplement in the high tourist season. And the high amount of supplements was associated with high levels of metabolic parameters. So elephant camps should limit the amount of supplement that give to elephants by tourists during the program, such as um, high quality treats, such, such as banana and sugar cake sugar cane uh, to restrict the, the amount of calorie and, and control their body condition. So uh, overall, our studies provide a new science-based knowledge about the elephant welfare used in tourism. And 
we we can say that good health and welfare of tourist elephants is supported is supported by the availability of water sources, allowing free foraging, reducing high calorie treats, controlling work intensity. We have to control the um, working hours, exercise, having natural rest area or natural flow substrates, controlling the overuse of equipment, promoting elephant mahout relationships, and promoting social interaction. So these uh, are the factors that we can extract from, from these uh, two PhD studies. So we used uh, uh, deep, very deep um, epidemiological statistical analysis to analyze this data and present the very fact data um, and try to adapt this kind of results to make something like a welfare guidelines or elephant camp standards to use in the uh, tourist elephants in Thailand. Thank you. Do you have the right? Do we have the right presentation? Uh, it should be Dr. Big next. Be Daniel, if you go, and then if we haven't got Dr. Big's slide at the end, then I can go and get it and we can sort it out. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm representing my own uh, company called Animundial, but I'm also here representing Travel Life for Tour Operators, uh, and that will become apparent um, with the presentation. But just to give you an insight um, as to who am I and, and what I do, um, my background is in biology and um, uh, animal welfare, applied animal welfare. Um, and I've been working for about two decades on trying to advance um, animal welfare knowledge uh, and application, mainly in uh, European legislation, um, but also um, in uh, tourism. And uh, at the Born Free Foundation, which is an international wildlife NGO, um, mainly focused on tourism, animals in tourism, and uh, in that 15-year period of doing so, um, undertook um, various um, guides and tools to help travel companies better understand the complexities of animal welfare and how to apply it uh, in, a, in a tourism perspective. Um, as I say, today I'm representing um, Travel Life for Tour Operators. Um, we've signed an agreement with them basically to help uh, their partners uh, better understand animal welfare um, and ensure that the practices that they are uh, selling and promoting uh, have a, a minimal uh, impact on animal welfare in the natural environment. So just a, a bit of background um, about uh, Travel Life and its particular work um, with uh, PATA, the, uh, the association. Um, they were have been developing uh, animal welfare or particularly focused on, on elephants, elephant in tourism, um, for about four years. Uh, this has involved a multi-stakeholder process. Um, it's involved um, people from different regions, both um, uh, different competencies, both the academics um, but also people on the ground as well as uh, owners of elephant camps, um, veterinarians, uh, and other stakeholders. Um, Pilot has been undertaken in numerous camps. Uh, it's yet to be fully applied, um, primarily because um, there are some discrepancies to sort out, uh, and that's basically where, where my role has come in. Uh, as far as what they look like, uh, these are the criteria that are followed within the Travel Life 
um, elephant standards. And you can see that they go into um, all components from management practices, general uh, individual animal welfare, uh, and then the interactions uh, with, the, with the tourists uh, themselves. Um, it is work in progress, um, but uh, this is where they stand at the moment. Uh, as far as who are engaged uh, in the project, uh, various uh, inbound uh, tour operators, um, but also some increasingly some outbound operators as well. The key component is um, the, taking the, um, the ethics aside. This is not an ethical uh, discussion. This is about dealing with the current problem. And as we know, there are thousands of uh, captive um, elephants in elephant camps across, uh, across Asia. We need to find a practical solution to address the problems and, and modify the product that makes it enjoyable for um, tourists, but also safe for the tourists and safe, for, um, safe and good for the, the elephants concerned. There is already a set of guidance out there. Uh, you may have heard of the ABTA Global Welfare Guidance for Animals in Tourism. Um, there are a series of, um, you can probably not see it on here, but there are a series of guides. Uh, they focus on general animal welfare principles uh, as a base requirement. Uh, and then there's some identified unacceptable and discouraged practices. Um, I drafted the initial draft of the, of the guidance document, but then it went through a series, a, a year's process of 250 uh, individual experts and industry in, uh, interested parties who uh, took the guidance and uh, fleshed it out and put in some uh, tangible requirements. Uh, so this is the elephant manual, elephant in tourism manual, that is not just about the, uh, not just about elephants in captivity, but also about elephants in the wild and viewing them responsibly. The problem that we have with standards is that many people produce standards and they rightly or wrongly involve different people to produce those standards. What we need is a is a constant approach, a continuity, alignment in approach. And so to everybody, um, particularly the camp owners who are required to meet different standards for different inbound and outbound operators. Uh, so my task, uh, hopefully in the next few months, uh, is to, to ensure that greater alignment between the ABTA Global Welfare Guidance and the Travel Life um, elephant standards. And I think that's it. Oh. No, that's not me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much for having me at this very interesting um, panel on a very complex topic. Um, I'm from Exo Travel. Oh, Logo is here. Um, um, Exo is one of the bigger DMCs in Southeast Asia. We operate now in 10 destinations. We have over 900 staff, so it's quite a big organization. Um, one of our core values in our company is actually sustainability. So for us, it's really um, a very, very important um, value we live by every day. This um, indicates how we operate, how we decide on policies, on our management. Um, from internal regulations to our operations to product development, how we work with the destinations, how we communicate with our clients, with the agents, um, it's Sustainability is one of the core values. Um, we also have a foundation, EXO Foundation, so with every traveler coming to Southeast Asia, one dollar gets donated to the foundation, which then is reinvested into different sustainability 
um, or sustainable development projects all over Asia. Um, we're at this stage now where we're really trying to work with our suppliers, engage, oh, sorry, yeah, um, where we engage our suppliers, where we want to work with our suppliers. Hi, sorry, I don't know, I want to make it stop. <laughs> Um, where um, we want to motivate the whole tourism industry, where we want to influence the tourism industry to become more responsible. Right? So we have a very inclusive approach. So first of all, we... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not pushing anything. <laughs> um, we have a very... Can you go back one? No, the other way. Um, we communicate on a regular basis with all our suppliers on um, our initiatives, so they know what we're doing, they know about our, our policies. Um, and then we're also assessing all our suppliers. So we... <laughs> I'm not... I'm not... It's going crazy. Um, we're assessing our, all our hotels, all our excursion suppliers, all our transport companies in terms of environmental and social and cultural aspects. Um, then we also came up with a few, um, with a whole set of policies, so different policies on child protection, environmental protection, and also one really important one, wildlife, and how to engage with wildlife, how to make sure our products do not harm any wildlife. Um, <laughs> can, we, can we go back to my slide? Yes, this one. Can we stop there? <laughs> this one? Yes. Okay, yeah. Keep it there. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, okay, so at EXO we realized a few years back um, that there's a lot of confusion going on. There were lots of campaigns in Europe um, addressing the issue of elephant tourism. So we thought, okay, we need to, we need to do something about it. And back then, 2014-15, we started having meetings with vets, animal welfare organizations, um, we used the APTA guidelines. I had a meeting with Jan, I remember, right in the beginning. So we developed our own assessment. Um, and then we went out to do the assessments in the elephant camps. So we spent a whole day with the elephant camps. We met mahouts, camp managers, camp owners, vets. We looked at the elephants. We did a right, maybe. We did the, um, all, the, all the program you can do. Um, and then we make sure that all our products are in line with our policies and all the camps we actually work with, that they have passed our assessment. Um, now, we're at, this, we're at the next step where we want to engage the camps, where we want to um, help and support the camps to actually become more responsible. Um, we've been an active member, what Daniel's um, already mentioned, the Travel Life Working Group. We've been an active member since the beginning of this working group. And um, now they started, for example, giving um, trainings to Mahouts on animal welfare. Um, for us, and I think sometimes that gets, uh, people tend to forget that, it's animal welfare is really, really important, but it also comes down to social issue, to human rights, conditions of the people employed by these elephant camps, the environmental impacts of these camps, and the social um, collaboration with the surrounding communities. Um, and yes, so now we also, with our foundation, we have the opportunity to really fund projects supporting um, not just elephant camps, but all animal-related um, projects to become more responsible and to really promote um, fair or ethical um, animal projects. Okay, thank you very much. Now, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hopefully we have Dr. Bick's presentation. Um, he likes to headline, so, uh, so something happened. Um, I have sent it through, so. He's got it on his phone. Okay, no problem. I can, uh, be, uh, during this time that I'm just wait for my slide, so I just introduce myself first. My name is Chachotitaram from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Chiang Mai University. 
and also I have PowerPoint here on my uh, mobile phone, <laughs> and then I can and like uh, follow this one, but probably you cannot see. Oh, you can see from here. It's too small. Okay. Malayo. Yeah. Oh, Malayo. Okay. So I'm from Chiang Mai University, and also I'm a director from uh, Center of Elephant and Wildlife Research, Chiang Mai University. Okay, and also I'm a member of uh, IUC in Asian Elephant Specialist Group. I also the, uh, graduated from uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Chulalongkorn University and also got a PhD from University of Utrecht, the Netherlands, in the topic of elephant reproduction and genetics. And also I got a diploma of the Terriogenology about reproduction. And also I have uh, more than 50, uh, 45 international publications. Yeah, it's elephant work. So my topic would be related to uh, elephant mobile clinic. That how elephant mobile clinic can help to improve animal, especially elephant welfare. So here you always see if you go to several elephant camps around Thailand or in our range country like this one, you always see that the vets also go out for the mobile clinic. And we I am focused in Thailand. You can see from here, uh, a bit difficult, in the north, like from Chiang Mai University, National Elephant Institute, uh, Save the Elephant Foundation, and also Thai Elephant Alliance Association that cover all around in the northern part of Thailand. Because in the northern part of Thailand, there are around more than one thousand, so maybe one fourth to one third of the whole population in Thailand. So this means there are quite a lot of mobile clinics to cover this area. In the northeast of Thailand, we have a zoological park of Thailand in cooperation to Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation and Veterinarians International, as well as, as Department of Livestock Development. They all service and to care for the health care of elephants in uh, northeast, where the population are around five to thousand. In the central part of Thailand, so this means from the uh, in Ayutthaya, in Kanchanaburi, Rajburi, on the western part, also go to the eastern part of Thailand. They are mainly with the three parts: Mahidol University, Kaseisa University, and uh, Asian Elephant Foundation of Thailand. They cover in this area, but in the south part, that's only National Elephant Institute. They all cover this area with a high number as well, uh, more than one thousand in the southern part. They also have elephant camp as well as a locking elephant in that area. Incorporate sometime when we go out, and there, if there is some of the like uh, intensive intensive case or severe case that we need some like a long-term intensive treatment and health care, we always suggest the owner send their elephant to the hospital. So if you see from here, we can see in the northern part, to Elephant Hospital from National Elephant Institute and Friend of Asian Elephant Foundation. The last, second one that is private section. In the central part, we have from Mahidon University and uh, Kaseisa University. In the northeast, from Department of Livestock Development, and in the south, uh, that is uh, belong to a National Elephant Institute in the elephant southern part of Thailand. So sometimes, if you see from the photo, sometimes there will be some general anesthesia that we have to do that need to be in the hospital, as well as some of the broken leg that we have to do the intensive care. Something like this one for the mobile clinic, we cannot involve because uh, it needs high intention and also special equipment. So we have to bring them to that place. And also some place we have to do like uh, this one in the field as well, like uh, for the check, even though for the wound cleaning or some elephant that lay down, we have to give uh, some intensive treatment to stand up or even though for the uh, fluid therapy. And also sometimes we have to access and help them. For instance, like this, this one, we use some of the thermoscope or infrared that we can see some of the inflammation around here at the knee joint that we can see some of the swelling and inflammation. And then what 
is uh, our role because uh, our, I think all of you know, like a veterinarian play very important role for uh, the elephant health care, elephant management, and elephant welfare. So our role sometimes, if we can help, we cannot resist that. Uh, this is uh, for the health care service. That is our job to tr do the treatment, for instance, like uh, the wound, some of the uh, gastrointestinal problems, or sometimes have eye problem. This is our job to do. And the second part, we have to educate the owner, even though for the mahout, how to have a better care of the elephants. For instance, like uh, if they want to do something very hard, okay, probably you have to reduce the uh, workload and then let the elephant to be uh, cured. And also preventive medicine, sometimes vaccination, or even though we have to go deeper, sometimes investigate of the uh, nutritional status, nutritional problems, also for the management as well, like uh, how many times that you want to give the food to elephants, or not only in one time, in one day, but you have to separate in several times to prevent of the colic, this is our work. Some training course we conduct as well, and sometimes you also take the elephant to the hospital for taking a rest. Sometimes elephant work quite a lot in that place, and then after that we, okay, it's time for elephant to be raised. So we suggest to send them to the hospital for the uh, taking a rest and also intensive care. And also some of the inside formation, because we have learned for six years, and then after that, something that happened, especially with related to the management, we all know that, okay, when some, somebody call us, okay, please treat this elephant, probably elephant uh, have not eat for some period of time, when we investigate more and more and more, we know that uh, this is something due to the management, because of the something happened due to, to their faults, not by elephant. Or even though when we do the necropsy of the elephant, we know something happened inside, so we know the cause, and then after that, that something could not hide for us because uh, we can investigate. And one thing for us, for the veterinarians, that uh, because we work quite a lot with them and also always help them, sometimes with the support, get uh, some budget to support, to treat of the elephant with a lot of money. And then after that, we have influenced them quite a lot because we already bring something really good to them, rarely with a bad thing. So when we start to do with them, the trustful occur between us, between veterinarians and the uh, uh, owner and the uh, mahout, and then after that, the thing that we want to improve the welfare, we will speak them a bit by a bit, or sometimes give a suggestion. Otherwise, we don't come. Yeah. And then after that, that is our uh, role to play and to improve their welfare. Yeah. This is my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Big. Okay, so we've got a little time where I'm going to ask a few questions and try and try and bring out a few points. My first one, I think, I'm, what I'll do is I'll ask a question and I think ask everybody to, to, to give an answer. Um, first one, I think, is with, we'll start with Dr. Yan because he has, uh, he's, he's probably, he's seen all the elephants everywhere. Um, is there any, We've talked a lot about Chiang Mai universe, uh, Chiang Mai elephants. Is there? Did you see any geographical difference within Thailand about the types of camp and the sorts of camp and the welfare? And then we can go on to do the veterinary clinics and everybody else. Yeah, I think <coughs> I think it's a good point. Um, we did. I didn't show those slides, but obviously we had a lot more analysis on the differences in the welfare condition scores between the different regions. We did see that the northern camps were had a tendency to have higher welfare. Um, than the southern camps. Um, southern camps tend to be, especially in the diet regime, but also in terms of what they offer to the tourist, um, less welfare oriented. Um, I think the north shows a lot more progressive movement towards um, different activities they, they offer, and some of them may be good, some of them are questionable. Um, but yeah, there is a regional difference, and I think that's, that's also important to note. Yeah, uh, for me as well, like uh, because I read her from his paper too, like uh, and then after that we can see, because we work with uh, some 
in the northern part and in the south or in the western or eastern part we can see like uh, one thing it could be because even the northern part we are quite close to the natural forest natural place and if you go to the eastern part or some part in the western part like uh, most of them would stay in the limited area yeah not really in the natural habitat so sometimes we can see uh, some of the different be from the geographic area but then anyway we can see some of the change gradually from time to time because uh, several things that happen especially from the uh, news that happen about uh, animal cruelty that happen from now and then probably we can see in the future as this is my first time in Thailand um, I think what I'd like to reflect on is um, because most of my work has been taking um, scientific studies such as these and others and kind of translating the outcomes into some tangible standards for travel companies to then apply and, and, and use. Um, so seeing, seeing the camps in reality I've never done before but over the last three days I had a very intense program of uh, visiting three in this region um, and it's kind of given me a completely, well, I'd say a very different perspective to the whole issue. Um, because obviously if you're writing guidelines, you're, you're uh, approaching it from one picture uh, perspective. And obviously if you then go to the camps, you're trying to apply that one picture to lots of different systems, as I found out. So um, I was finding... Um, uh, different camps having different types of activities, um, different, uh, you know, some places the animals moved from, from one place to the other. Um, other. Other camps, it was just the people that moved and the elephants stayed where they were. So, I mean, I've, I've just sort of listed down some practices that I've kind of uh, identified as a concern if I apply the, an the ABTA standards. Um, so, so my sort of deliberations were, um, the uncontrolled con uh, contact between the public and the animals. There were lots of opportunities for people to be seriously injured um, just because they weren't, they weren't being looked over as far as uh, identifying any problems if they exist. Um, there seems to be quite a lot of breeding going on um, and I would question the reasons for that, particularly if you're trying to improve lies for the animals that are already in the camps. Um, basic animal welfare knowledge seems to be minimal. Working within, within the EU with veterinarians um, and teaching them about animal welfare, it, it's not just a, a, an Asian, uh, Southeast Asian issue, it's a European issue. Most, ve most veterinarians actually don't have animal welfare knowledge. Um, training and conditioning, I think, is a, a concern and has already been highlighted. Um, I think you've got to value the mahouts more. If you value the mahouts, then you'll actually get better standards for the elephants. And, and I think the mahouts are often left out of the equation uh, and they should definitely be within it. Anything to add on the geography side of things? Well, that wasn't geography. <laughs> So my experiences is because in the northern Thailand uh, and we found uh, different types of work. Uh, there are five types, uh, five main types of work right now in elephant camps in northern Thailand. Uh, riding with a saddle or riding with a chair on the back of elephants, uh, riding bareback. Um, the tourist can ride on the neck or back of elephants. Uh, no riding. No riding is mean um, tourists can walk with elephant without without riding. They can feed them. They can bath them. They can walk with them. And the next one is the show elephant. Uh, most of them are baby, like less than 15 years of age. So they use them to show painting, kicking football, dancing, something like that. And the last one is the observation only program. Uh, unfortunately, that we have only 
one camp in our study, and they just let um, the group of elephants um, stand stand still in the or the whole day, and they move the group of tourists to visit each group of elephants. So uh, that group of elephants has no chance to freely walk, so, and they walk only less than two kilometers per day to bath um, and um, drink in the near, nearest river. So there are five types of work, but um, the thing that we found from, from the survey that uh, there is a trend to shift. Um, older camps tend to have a um, riding with a saddle and chow, and the newer camp tend to change from the high intensive activities like riding uh, to more intimate activities, more relaxed activity like um, no riding, just uh, feeding, bathing, and walk with elephants, something like that, like do more relaxed and uh, more educational program. Okay. Um, I think uh, Jan's, uh, Jan's presentation identified a problem, or two presentations identified a problem. One is the one you've just mentioned that I saw yesterday, which is in Mewang. Lot of baby elephants. There's a lot of baby elephants everywhere. And as Jan, Jan's study said, that the mahouts are either not necessarily old-style mahouts, and or they don't have any wish to carry on. They're not enjoying their job. So if we're getting more elephants, and the mahouts don't want to go into the next generation, and that's also found, I'm not sure it's a tourism thing necessarily, because there was a, uh, a study out a couple of weeks ago from Myanmar with logging mahouts saying the same thing. How do we address that problem? And you, you're asking, asking about the idea behind breeding, and there's several reasons why people want to breed. It's to continue the culture and all those other things. Also, there's money involved. But the serious problem for us is, as elephant managers is how we address the problem of mahouts not wanting to be mahouts and elephants growing up. How would you address that? Okay, uh, this is two points, like uh, from uh, John about that one, first about the baby or uh, breeding, and also a second one about the mahout. First, I would like to see, especially from the dem demographic thing, <clears throat> like uh, I point out one part from a uh, young presentation, that 1992, the elephant population increased around 30% until now. Anyway, this is uh, some part, but if you look back more about that one from around 100 years ago. So this mean would be in the late of uh, 19th century or about uh, 1900 in that part. So in Thailand, we have around 100,000 elef uh, captive elephants in Thailand. So if you mean from here, the population declined much faster during that time and come back to now. So if you start from 1982, the population increased maybe 200, 300% of that one. But then when you come from here, the population increased now. But anyway, if we compare to 100 years ago, we can see like a population decline and much different. But anyway, if you talk about uh, some of the area that we have that one, I say yes, because right now in Thailand and also several countries, in particular in Asia and Southeast Asia, the natural habitat has been destroyed and the natural area like a forest now declined to around 25% of the whole area. And then after that we have to see what is the optimal number of uh, captive elephant that it should be. Also, that we still don't talk about white elephant because sometimes it would be in that area too. But anyway, if we talk about elephant welfare and also for the proper place that we should take this one into account. And anyway, right now when we several camps that try to breed elephant now, that we want to maintain the population. As you see when uh, from the knowledge that I work from my PhD about elephant reproduction, that elephants spend around five years to get one baby because their generation length take very long. But when elephant die, it die within one day 
Yeah. So if we want to see and make this one to make uh, to maintain the population, we have to see the balance, something like this one, because uh, we still don't have the actual number for the population increase and decrease. Sorry, we've only got ten minutes left. Aren't we? Okay. So, yeah. but the question, my main question was, I understand the breeding is going on, but how do we how do we make sure that those babies have mahouts going forwards who are good qualified? Mahouts who will know how to look after the elephants, given the lack of interest from both Yan and the Myanmar study for people to be mahouts. I mean, obviously there has to be an incentive to to go into that uh, area of work, and I think you need to. They need to be valued within society. And the impression I got over the last three days or so is that there doesn't appear to be a value to that role. Um, I think if you had an improved, I think you've got the infrastructure to do it. You've got a sort of an educational facility for, for mahouts. If you encouraged, if you made it a mandatory requirement for all mahouts to go through some kind of training, uh, if they got a, a sort of certificate or badge of honour from doing that training, uh, that brings value to uh, the service that they're providing. And if you had a tiered process whereby you had different levels of service within being a mahout, I think that would also be an encouragement. And you see that in other professions, um, particularly veterinarians who, who start off at a fairly low level, and then if they go and do extra courses, they get points to their, uh, to their profession. And I think you just apply something that works in another profession to this one. And I, I think that's the way forward. And I'll be interested to know whether that's doable in Thailand. Yeah, um, just to, I do have to mention quickly something on the population. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there was a reason that I compared it to 1992, because it was always the argument, well, all these poor logging elephants need an income. Um, that's not really the case. We have so much more elephants because of tourism. There's less than half of the elephants in captivity now from the logging ban. Um, I'm glad we don't have 100,000 elephants in captivity in Thailand these days because I don't know how we would manage to keep them. Um, it's not about conserving elephants in captivity. Well, it, it may in Thailand be. There is, it's a difficult topic, but um, I think there is a danger to mix conservation of elephants in the wild with the number we have in captivity. Um, so I'm, I'm worried about the breeding um, numbers, but there's other opinions on, out there. It does lead, though, to the mahout question as well. And what we see, um, like I said, I mean, we, we do have a lot of elephants and very few skilled mahouts um, to do that. I think to develop more skilled mahouts, we need environments that respect mahouts better and allow mahouts to, to thrive on it and feel valued for the work they do. Um, seeing a lot of the camps that I've been to, I found the camps um, that I would here call these elephant-friendly camps or observation-only camps, um, it probably wasn't the one that um, you've been to because I, I know this one as well, but um, the ones we work with, I, I find the mahout integration um, exceptional. Um, the value of mahouts by the camp managers, but also um, how the mahouts can interact with the tourists, and um, they feel very appreciated as well at the same time. We work with one camp at the moment, um, former riding camp, and we help them change their practices. And the way we do this, we talk to the mahouts and ask them actually how they would feel it, it's best for the elephants to do things. And it was very strange for them to actually be asked, how, why, why would you ask us what to do with the elephants? Normally it's the camp manager who tells us what to do it. But once they got the idea, they became really proactive and really engaged in the whole process and became more um, involved in the whole thing. And I think that's, that's really important to consider. Thank you. Um, there's a lot more things to consider as well, but I've been told we've got five minutes left, so should we quickly open up to one or two questions from the floor and then uh, ask for another session to keep discussing this afternoon? That was a joke. Jaffe. Uh, my name is Jaffe Yi from Knowledge Media Group. I have a question. 
for the partner. What do you think is considered to be abusive, especially as far as the stakeholder is concerned, uh, for elephant tourism, uh, such as riding an elephant or making elephant perform, uh, like in a circus? I think a lot of elephant festival get elephant involved with a lot of activities. And uh, I remember when I first moved to Thailand like 30 years ago, I went to Surin, and that was amazing. And there was a lot of fun, the elephant festival. And obviously, there are a lot of things that consumers are concerned today is they feel that something is abusive to the animal, but the stakeholder do not think so. So I wonder what are considered to be abusive and what are not. Thank you. Does anyone want to take that one? That's a subject for about 15 panels, I think. But yeah, I think everybody has something to say on that one. Um, so um, I think the opinions in that vary a little bit. But from our point of view, um, it, we need to look at which conditions um, allow the elephants to express their normal biological needs as most as possible. Um, if we look at show elephants, performance elephants, there are shows in Thailand um, that have 30 elephants performing uh, six times a day. Um, it's, it's really intense. I think there's pretty much, I think, a strong consent in this panel that performance animals, elephants particularly, that's definitely not a place to be. Um, when it comes to riding, um, for us, we are very concerned about riding, especially saddled riding activities simply because we see those activities very repetitive. Um, they can be very quickly, very intensive. They allow for very little time for the elephants to actually express natural behavior in between the rides. They would just stand on site, wait for the next visitor. It's, it's just a logistic thing that once you have a saddle on the elephant, you, you're bound to control the elephant. You cannot let the elephant roam around freely. And that limits a lot of, of what an elephant needs to do. That's our prime concern with, with riding. The other activities, the concern comes mostly from the safety of the visitors. So direct interaction, washing, all these sort of things, they expose the visitor in a very vulnerable position to an elephant, and that can lead to accidents. So again, it brings it back to our recommendation, what we would like to see, especially from the responsible travel companies, to as much as possible try to support initiatives that work towards observation-only models, but addressing concerns that were raised here, that elephants, only observation only is not going to solve it. There needs to be good practices behind it as well that allow elephants to move and express other activities. But that's for us where we hope to move. Uh, in my opinion, I believe that every type of work is not bad for elephant. Um, observation is OK. Writing is OK. Um, no riding is okay, in my opinion, but the elephant camps have to limit the workload and manage um, all the factors in the middle way, like use them in the limit of the working hours, limit their walking distance, and let them exercise enough, but not work too hard to let their feet like, cause a nail crack, for example. So we need to control the manage all the management factors as much as possible to protect the, the uh, health and welfare problems. I, I mean, I think uh, addressing your question, I think that sort of aren't the fact that we need standards because that brings in the continuity of actually understanding when, what, irrespective of the activity, it, what you should be looking at is whether the animal is in a suitable environment. If your assessment, irrespective of the activity, concludes that the activity is detrimental to the animal's welfare, then they shouldn't be doing that, particularly if you're wanting animal um, elephant-friendly tourism. Um, so whilst there is a potentially this transitional approach to an observation-focused elephant tourism, there needs to be standardization that adequately protects the individual animals in these facilities. 
just a short address. Like, uh, of course, I, uh, for showing that is unnatural, I support that it should not happen because it's, if it repeats several times a day and for a year, it can cause some of the health issues as well. But for the writing, I don't see any problem because from the uh, PhD thesis of Dr. Pakanut, you can see just only 5% of elephant writing with that dose has a wound on that one. But anyway, I do support your idea to have an elephant standard. That, and also for the elephant tourism, that's key, this kind of thing can push the elephant to have a better management and better welfare, this one. So this is of our power of the elephant tourism that can help the elephant welfare. Okay, um, I'm told that's all we have time for. So uh, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you everybody for, for coming along. Um, I think just to sum up, it seems that uh, we're all in agreement that we should be helping elephants, um, that we've got to, we can recommend different activities, but we need to make sure that we're, when, however those activities are carried out, they're done with the best with the best knowledge of what, what elephants need, what elephants need to show their natural behavior, um, and to make sure that we're not causing them undue stress. Um, I've got to put my elephants on a diet, but I've known that for a while because I talked to Dr. Im about it. Um, and we need to wait for uh, Daniel's standards to come out to find out, but we'll, we'll keep working together and providing everybody with the best, most up-to-date information and build a standard from that, and then supply it to you guys to uh, help educate your guests. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much once again. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, right now we are going to have a uh, refreshment and then uh, the next session are going to start at uh, 4 p.m. So I believe that you have received a very informative session from this panel discussion, but we still have one more um, coming for all of you. But right now I would like to inform for any of um, our board participants who have a full package and registered already. And if you're not um, book your post tour yet, please do contact our uh, staff at the registration counter because we have to um, book and all can have the, all the lists from um, w anyone who are interested to join for the elephant um, route and also the natural route. So right now, thank you very much once again. And uh, for the next session, I would like to inform for all speakers and the moderator for the next session, please come before um, like the, 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 the session will be start before like 10 minutes maybe to contact our staff for the setup. Thank you very much.